it's great to have everybody here for our Christmas service. And it's good to have uh, people back visiting in town and to see all the kids there. That was awesome. I was, I was loving it. Thank you, Richard, for that introduction. It got me prepared. That was, that was incredible. Um, so it's, it's awesome to be together. We're excited to be here. If you're, welcome, if you're here with us, we want to welcome you. And uh, we hope that you have an amazing time and get to make some friends and worship with us today. Thank you. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about waiting for Christmas, and I wanted to see what are you waiting for for Christmas? What is something that you're looking forward to as Christmas is coming? Okay, I hear family time. Good food. Extra rest. Extra rest. Can I get an amen? amen. Chili and apple cider. Chili and apple cider. Okay, that sounds good. Anybody else? What are you looking forward to? Jeff? For the year. A new year. He's looking for a new year. Okay, there we go. Steve? Getting up with the grandkids. Oh, yes. Not just the getting up with the grandkids, but being with the grandkids, right? Feli? Tamales. All right, I want to go to your house. Uh, so waiting for Christmas, it can be an exciting time of year. Sometimes we're limping through to the end of the year, but it's an exciting time. I came across some letters to Santa, and he does read all of these, by the way. So when you send them, he does get them. It says, Dear Santa Claus, when you come to my house, there will be cookies for you. But if you're real hungry, you can use our phone and order a pizza to go. <laughs> so very thoughtful young man uh, or girl there. Uh, another one, Dear Santa, this was something that came out at our midweek service. Dear Santa, I want a puppy. Aww. James may be selling a puppy or giving one away, I don't know. <laughs> I want a puppy. I want a playhouse. Thank you. I've been good most of the time. Sometimes I'm wild. <laughs> this was probably written by your kid. <laughs> Dear Santa, from a four-year-old, I'll take anything because I haven't been real good. <laughs> Okay, so poor, a poor guilty soul, a guilty conscience four-year-old. It starts already. <laughs> I like this one. Dear Santa, I'm not going to ask for a lot. Here's my list. An Etch-A-Sketch animator, two packs of number two pencils, Crayola fat markers, and the big gift, my own colored TV. <laughs> well, maybe you can drop the pencils. I don't want to be really selfish. <laughs> Maybe that was written by your child. I don't know. But it's awesome to be a child and be looking forward to Christmas and coming out and uh, seeing if Santa came and what he brought you and just being together. Uh, I know it's a special time of year. And I pray that you don't miss Christmas this year. With all the stuff going on, that's what we're here today for, to really focus on Jesus as we get into Christmas. Uh, last year... Uh, probably the most excited person last year and this year for Christmas is among us. Who thinks they're the most excited person for Christmas? Okay. All right. It's going to be close, but I think, I think Gabe's got it. Okay. Uh, for those of you who are visiting with us, last year he flew over to Bali to uh, start dating this sweet sister over there, Dee, Deanne. And uh, she said yes, so they started dating. They've been dating for a year now, and they've been, uh, next week will be a year. And then this Christmas, Gabe's going out to Hong Kong this time, and he's hoping to come back. What are you hoping for, bro? Engagement. All right, Gabe is hoping to get engaged. So pray for Gabe. I think he might be more excited than you. I know he's more excited than me, even though I'm excited. I mean, he's up there, uh, but we'll be praying for you uh, on your journey there and look forward to hearing the good news. And he does get the most festive award. Can you stand up for us, please, Gabe? Okay. Model that. Okay. So if you want to get a picture afterward with the most excited person for Christmas, you can. He's right here. Um, that'll be awesome. Uh, but Christmas is a fun time. It brings back a lot of great memories. Uh, hopefully you uh, can, have been reflecting on that. One of my favorite Christmases was when my brother and his family came to Connecticut for a white Christmas. 
And they came up from Florida. Their, his kids had never seen snow before. We're going to have a white Christmas for the first time. It's going to be awesome. And they get there, and everything is brown. <laughs> There's not a drop of snow anywhere, and it just looks ugly, right? It's just brown. The grass is dead. There's nothing green. It's horrible. So we go out for Christmas morning. We're going to the tree, and we see a snowflake fall. And 30 inches later, by the end of the day, <laughs> that was the most amazing white Christmas I've ever had. And they got to be there, and it was just like such a... So they're sledding in the front yard, and we just had such a great time. They never seen snow. It was awesome. But God comes through on Christmas. At least he did that year. Uh, but today, what I want to focus on is this sentence here. If you want to take a picture of it, you can. To, be, to marvel and be moved... By the message of Jesus this Christmas, to marvel and be moved. I believe that's what God wants from every single person in here, to be amazed and be moved by Jesus this Christmas, to be inspired by him, by the ultimate gift that God has given us. Turn over to Luke chapter 2, in verse 22. It says, when the time of the purification According to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of two dove, a dove and two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had moved, it revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the law, custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as, I, as you have promised, so now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul, too, talking about the cross. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. An amazing story. In verse 33, it says, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Just amazed at all that God had done, the miraculous birth, the miraculous birth of John the Baptist, the journey down to Bethlehem, the having a baby in a cave with the animals and the shepherds coming and the wise men. And now you're in the temple and you hear these amazing words said about your son, knowing that he's ultimately God's son. And it said they marveled at Jesus. What a miracle. What a blessing. What an amazing journey that they were on. My point number one is marvel. Marvel. Marvel this Christmas at Jesus. Marvel at the amazing gift that God has given you. Marvel at the, the, the amount of effort and time and precious energy that God put into this birth of Jesus. You know, it's, it's been said that the King of Kings was born in the humblest of circumstances. That the creator of the universe was born homeless, basically, in a cave. And that was for a reason, that when they went to offer their offering, instead of offering the Passover lamb, which they were supposed to offer, they couldn't afford it. They had to offer two doves instead, because that was their 
financial situation. You know, I pray that you marvel at Jesus this, this Christmas time. You know, and a lot of times when you're a preacher and it comes to Christmas, it's kind of limiting. You know, there's about eight passages that you can use, and they're all within four chapters in the Bible. So if you do it for a while, you only have a couple options. But this year, instead of being frustrated by that, like I typically am, I was marveling at how God put the story together. Amen. That he gave us eight of the things that he wanted us to remember when we think about Jesus. I got this idea, if anybody wants to write it, the 10 scenes of Christmas and go through the Christmas story through the 10 different scenes. I don't really have time to write it, but if you want to write it, I want to work with somebody to write the book. But he talks about the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary and to Joseph. He talks about Elizabeth and her miraculous birth. It talks about Zechariah and him being speechless as he goes into the temple and then he learns that his son is going to prepare the way for Jesus. Of course, it talks about Joseph and it talks about Mary and the their, their faith journey and their journey to Bethlehem. It talks about the census that I've heard was delayed for years so they could happen at this exact time. It talks about the shepherds and the wise men. And today we're going to look at the post-birth event in the temple with Simeon and Anna. And then he talks about the boys in Bethlehem and their escape to Egypt. But I want you and my challenge for all of us is this Christmas time to contemplate the amazing gift that God has given you with Jesus. Look at these stories, not just like, oh, I've heard these stories before that God prepared this for thousands. Of he could have had anything happen. And this is exactly how he wanted his son to come into the world. He could have given us 20,000 chapters on this time. But he gave us the eight or ten situations that he wanted to give us the message of his son. And it is amazing and sometimes we hear it over and over again, and it gets old. The story doesn't get old. It's our hearts that get old. And so my challenge for all of you is to marvel, and for myself, to marvel and be moved by the message of Jesus this Christmas. Don't go through Christmas, and when you're done, say, I survived. Some of you are surviving. I, sorry about that. When you shared, you were surviving the year. Go through Christmas and be amazed. And be in awe of what God is doing. I believe Satan wants to get us distracted on all kinds of different things. Yeah. And not to marvel at the gift of Jesus. Point number two, be moved. I love this quote. It says, where God, worship, where God isn't moved by the quality of our voice, but the condition of our hearts. That God is moved by us, and he wants to move us this Christmas. And I'm amazed that Simeon, it says that he was moved by the Spirit. He went into the temple courts when the parents brought the child Jesus in. And just to imagine the expectation that he was promised that before you die, you're going to meet the Messiah. And now God hadn't spoken to the people in 400 years. Malachi, the last book in the Bible, was written 400 years earlier, and yet he's the one chosen to see the Messiah. And he's faithful to the very end. And imagine that moment when the Spirit says, hey, it's time. Go to the temple. He's there. And him coming in and this gentle older man grabbing your six-week-old baby. I wish Riley was here. She's about six weeks old right now. Oh, she is here. But I pictured it, if you want to think of an old friend here, a, a friend of the church, Ted Saltz. Imagine Ted Saltz grabbing baby Riley and walking around, never met her before, and, and saying, wow, these amazing things. How God had blessed him. His life was over. It said that he could go to God in peace. And what he was looking for was the consolation of Israel, the comfort of God's people who had been oppressed. You know, the universal need that every single one of us desire is to be understood, to be comforted, to be consoled, to have God take away all of our problems and carry us in his arms. You know, it's an amazing gift. God with us. 
And just a couple chapters later in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus starts his ministry, he talks about this comforting spirit that he came to bring. It says, the spirit of the Lord is on me, in Luke chapter 4, 18, because he anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That Jesus came to bless God's people. I pray that this Christmas you're moved by the Spirit that Jesus wants to bless your life. That he wants to show favor to you. That he wants to lift you up. And that actually he is doing everything in his power to do that right now. Whatever kind of year you've had, whatever has brought you here to this point, God has put you here so that you can be comforted so that you can be carried, so that you can be encouraged, so that you can know you're not alone, so you can know that Jesus came for you. Literally, we don't have the voice in our head saying, go to the temple because the comfort of Israel is there like Simon did. But we have his word that tells us that he is here for each one of us if we're willing to open up to him, if we're willing to be moved by him. The second person is Anna. It says, coming up to them at that very moment. So she was a prophet. She was, most people think she was divorced at 20 years old. And then she was in the temple for 64 years before Jesus came. Worshiping, fasting, praying. She devoted her life to God. And at the very moment that Simeon comes up to Jesus, she's there to witness and experience this life of Jesus. God has arranged things in her life, had arranged things in her life so that she would be there at the perfect time to be able to see the salvation of Israel. Do you believe that God arranges the exact times and places in your life so that you can see him? He's doing everything in this story to get people close to Jesus, and he still is doing everything in your story to get you closer to Jesus. To work out your life, to set it exactly up in the way so that you'll turn to him. So that you'll see the amazing gift that God has put in your way. When Jesus is baptized in Luke chapter 4, it says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in and every hill and mountain made low. The crooked roads will become straight and the rough ways smooth. And all people will see God's salvation. That he is trying to do that in your life. To remove everything that gets in the way of you seeing Jesus. You know, this week I was talking to a friend who had been on a journey to get closer to Jesus and he came to church finally. After a long time, a few months ago, and he loved it, and his family loved it, and they went home, and he said, from that point on, my life got crazy, and everything started happening and working out of town, and he sent me a text today that was just heartbreaking, and the whole time I'm thinking, the gift is right here. God is giving you this amazing gift, and yet all these things are getting in the way of you receiving it of you even understanding the gift that God... I wonder if we really understand the gift that God's trying to give us and we're willing to fight for that gift or do we just think it's going to come our way? God gives us the chance. I pray that this Christmas that you see that timing in that way that God has moved you to give you that gift. Right now we're going to have Bill and Kelly come up And they're going to share a little bit about the timing in their life and how God moved in their story. So give it up for Bill and Kelly. Right Right as Scott said, my name is Bill Vollmer, and this is my beautiful wife, Kelly. And we are going to share a little bit of how God moved in our lives. And my wife is going to start us off. Amen. All right, well, good afternoon. 
Um, I really love this time of year. Um, as we were talking about earlier, I'm one of those people that loves Christmas. I love all the holidays, but I especially love Christmas. And um, beyond all the festivities and the cool lights, I really do love it because I do think it's a time that we spend more time than normal really marveling at Jesus and who he is and the story about him. And I really love that part of the year. Um, I love too just being able to think about the gifts that God has given us in our lives. And I think that um, because of the gifts in our lives and because of Jesus and his story, Bill and I really have an amazing story, and we want to be able to share that with you today. So our story actually starts when we were in fifth grade. We were, were the same age, and Bill used to chase me around the playground in fifth grade. I called him Billy back then. I still call him Billy sometimes when he's not paying attention to me. I call him Billy. Um, but uh, we had a, a great friendship even back then, and after middle school, Bill moved, and so throughout high school, we would see each other in the summertime, but in between, we would write each other letters and actually talk on the phone, the kind that had to be plugged into the wall that you had to dial, and letters on paper. There was no social media at the time. I know I'm confusing some of the younger people. They're like, what? Um, but during our senior year, Bill moved back to the town that um, I grew up in, and we dated our senior year. And as you know, wise as you can be as an 18-year-old, we really messed that up thoroughly and stopped dating. And we went our separate ways. And after high school, um, in college, I had the great, great blessing of becoming a Christian. And after that, went on and got married and had kids and had a very amazing, amazing uh, blessed life. And about 25 years later, I was getting ready for my high school reunion, and our high school set up this fake Facebook page where you could, you know, meet, you know, talk to people and stuff, getting ready to go to the reunion. And so I really was trying to use that opportunity to share with people how God had changed my life and invite them to church. And so I was sharing about that on the Facebook page with different people, and Bill started sharing some of the really challenging things going on in his life at the time. And so my husband, Steve, and I talked and talked about the best way really to help Bill see that Jesus was really the greatest gift and the greatest answer for the problems that he had going on in his life and really how to help him with his marriage. And so we together shared um, with Bill about Jesus and about the church that we went to, and we invited him and his wife. They lived in Colorado Springs, but invited them to really go to church and see what God had to offer them. And we gave them the name and the number of the couple um, in the church there and really hoped that they would attend. So life went on from there, and as sometimes happens, life doesn't turn out the way that we would hope that it would or the way that we think that it would. And so Bill and I both found ourselves in circumstances that we probably never thought we would have been in 25 years earlier. Uh, Bill's marriage ended, and my husband ended up passing away. But the amazing thing is, is that God was, was working. God had a plan um, for us and was continuing to put together the pieces of what would become our story. And so Bill's going to share the rest of that with you. Right. I'm not sure why I opened that up because I never remember to look at it. I just kind of talk. But anyway, okay, so I'm going to pick it up after she had told me about the church out there in Colorado Springs and stuff. And because of that past history and the friendship that we had, I agreed to go check it out because I wasn't really looking for God at the time. I was not really looking for anything. I was, like she said, I was going to, through a divorce. It was at that point in time, it was actually just ending. We were just kind of waiting for paperwork to come back. Um, so she didn't want to go to church with me, so I showed up, decided to go to church, all right, I'm going to go, get there, don't know anybody, had to work the courage up just to get in, walk through the door, walk in there, the very first person I meet within a minute of being in there was a guy named George Cullens, and him and his wife actually knew Stephen Kelly from way back in San Diego, so there was that instant connection there, just knowing the same person, um, so we continued to talk and, and built a great friendship. Um, at the time, I was doing long haul trucking. So I was gone like long time. I mean, like four or five weeks at a time and I would be back. So at the end of service, I told them, you know, I really loved it. I'll see you in like a month or two because I'm gone. And so I, off I go back trucking around. I get a message from the company I was working for saying, hey, we saw that you were interested in this dedicated run out of Cheyenne. I was like, well, no, I never put anything in. I don't know anything about that. You were supposed to have worked for the company for at least a year before you could submit your name into getting those dedicated runs, and I'd only been working there for six months. 
It's like, all right. So I check into it. I'll take it. You work six days a week. You get one day off any day you want. It's like, all right, I'll take Sunday off. Perfect. So they would run me around all week. Saturday nights, they would usually get me close to the Colorado Springs. And then I would end, I don't know, three, four, five o'clock in the morning, something like that. And I would take off, jet back up to Cheyenne, drop the trailer off, run back down and make it in time for church at 10 o'clock. So I did that for a couple months. And then uh, one time I got to where I didn't get done until about 8 o'clock, 7, 8 o'clock, something like that. And it was like, it's a three-hour trip each way. So, well, there's no way I'm making it all the way back up to Cheyenne and making it back to church. So I just parked the truck out in front of the church, right? Took a little nap and then went, went inside the church. Well, man, that was awesome because I actually got some sleep. So I started doing that all the time. <laughs> so when I would get off my final delivery, I would just park the truck and trailer straight out in front of the church. I mean, right out in front of the church. <laughs> get a couple hours of sleep, get up, brush my hair, brush my teeth, and go in and have church. Um, so that friendship kept going with me and George, and then a couple other guys got in there, and they decided to uh, give up their Sundays and, and hang out with me after church, and we would study the Bible, and it took a few months, because we I was only there that one day a week, so it took a few months, ended up getting baptized, um, really found what I was looking for, even though I didn't know what I was looking for. My life was a mess, and uh, I just wanted change, and I didn't really know what that was, and it ended up being God, and, and God really filled my life full of great things. Um, we continued to connect a little bit after that. Um, as, as she had shared, her husband had passed away, and uh, she would call and, and check up on me and how my studies were going and, and stuff like that. And we continued to build that friendship to a point where we wanted to see if there was anything there from those younger days when we were wild and crazy. Um, so I came out here, I got on the plane, I got off work Sunday morning, got on the plane, came out here. We had this whirlwind of double dates that was a little mind-boggling at the time, but it was awesome. I got to meet a lot of people in the church, a lot of, a lot of you guys here. Um, went back, flew back to Denver Monday morning, went back to work. Really knew at that moment when I saw her, I met her at the Westin, when we, you guys, you know, when we used to meet up at the Westin, I met her right there after church on Sunday, and when I saw her walk out, I actually knew right then, right, that it was, that was it, that she was the one for me. Um, so, right, now I'm going to get off. But anyway, back to the story. Um, I moved out here a month later. It's like, you know what, I'm, I'm ready. The guys had to slow me. I wanted to move right then. And uh, Alan Gower, I know a lot of guys... You guys know him. He was the minister out there. He kept talking to me and saying, you know, slow down, slow down, slow down. It's like, all right. But about a month later, I moved out here. Uh, about, I don't know, four or five months after that, I asked her to, to go steady with me to start dating. And we dated for a few months. And then I asked her to marry me. And she said, yes. Yeah. Right? And then a few months after that, we got married. And it's been five years. And God is still still working on our amazing story and our wonderful life. Amen. Thanks, you guys, for letting us share. Amen. Well, thank you guys for, here, for sharing that. And I guess you've never shared that here with the church. So it's cool to hear the amazing ways that God was moving and I hope you hear between the lines that it wasn't just them liking each other and then coming back together and get married, but they made decisions along the way, Kelly, to be faithful to God for 25 years and to be faithful through the, her husband passing away and to still continue on faithful to God going forward. You know, it's one thing to feel like, man, God's going to do it all for me, but he, he doesn't. He, he gives you the opportunity to be faithful. And he sets it up where Bill didn't have to ask for Sundays off, but he did. Because that was a priority to him. Something as small as that. Any day you want off, you can have it. And he chose to, to pick Sundays and to pursue God. After being a single guy for however many years. 
doing things his own way, calling his own shots, and now all of a sudden he has to let Jesus call the shots for him. That's one thing when you're 18, but it's another thing when you're 40-something. Are you willing to be moved by Jesus this Christmas? To still allow him to direct your life? I don't care how long you've been a Christian. Are you still willing to be moved? If God says that you need to move, would you do it? If God said that your job's getting in the way of your relationship, God, with, with him, would you quit? If God said this person in your life is not helping you spiritually, are you willing to distance yourself? You know, if God says whatever is getting in the way of your relationship with him, are you willing to be moved? Or are you all set? See, I'm glad that Bill and Kelly, they weren't all set. They were wet, ready and able to be molded by God. Because I don't know about you, I got a lot to work on. Looking at 2018, I got a lot to grow and a lot to change. I don't want to ever be at the point where I'm all set with God. Where I refuse to be moved. And yet, sometimes we can have that spirit. I've been like this for so long, don't try to tell me what to do. God's not telling you what to do. He is helping you to grow to be more like his son. And sometimes that takes telling me what to do because what I want to do is not always the spiritual thing. You know, think about your life. Did you think you'd be sitting exactly where you are in your life right now? With the person you're with, with the job that you're in, with the bank account that you have, with the health that you have, with all the situations in your life? Anyone? We think we call the shots in our lives. God puts us where he wants us to be. And we have the choice whether we're going to see him in it and make the best of it and have a good attitude or whether we're going to turn off and refuse. And I pray that this Christmas that you're willing to be moved. God's gotten you this far, but he's not done with you yet. Don't just go into another year and go, oh, well, I hope I make it through another year. If your attitude is to survive spiritually, you're going to die. We always need to have the attitude that I want God to mold me. I want God to change me. I want to be different next year than I am this year. I want to be more faithful. I want to be more loving. I want to be more evangelistic. I want to be more compassionate. That was my word for this year, to be more compassionate. You know, I pray that we are open to God. Finally, and in conclusion, that To marvel and be moved by the message of Jesus this Christmas. You know, Simeon and Anna, they had an amazing message. It said that he took them in his arms and just praised God. And said, man, I've finally seen your salvation. A light to the Gentiles, which was totally new. A glory for your people, Israel. It says that Anna gave thanks and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to God's blessings for, for Jerusalem. I pray that this Christmas that you are moved, that you are filled with God's message, that you are more convicted today, that you're more inspired today, that you're more passionate today to talk about Jesus than you've ever been in your life. To marvel and be moved by the message of Jesus. Now as we take our communion to think about the comfort that only he provides. He meets your needs. He carries your burdens. He knows your sorrows. He knows your hopes and your dreams. And he carries you in his arms. He meets our needs of forgiveness. That he knows when we fall short. He knows how imperfect we are, and yet he makes us perfect through the blood of his son. That was the whole point of him sending Jesus. And I love this Time where we get to think about the the communion, the death, and the burial, and the resurrection that started at Christmas that that continues on even till today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this time to worship you, to remember your son this time of year. 
God, I pray that you help us to marvel at your greatness, at your goodness, at your awesomeness, God, that we can be more enthralled with you than we ever have been. God, help us to be moved and to be willing to be moved by you, God, that you're leading us, that you're still guiding us, even now, even this minute. Help us to give up control of our lives and trust you with it. And God, I I pray that Jesus can be on our hearts more and more as we go into the Christmas, but go into the new year. God, help us to be faithful to you till the day we die. Thank you for your son. Thank you for his sacrifice. And we pray in his name. Amen.